Oh, hey, how you guys doing? Welcome in. It's the Evan Flow Podcast. Good to see all of you. I'm out for my evening workout. Feels good to be out here. New year, 2024. We're keeping it stoked, y'all. This episode, epic conversation with my brother, Dr. Chris Shade, founder of Quicksilver Scientific. He's an absolute wizard, a modern day Merlin. I love Dr. Chris, he's deeply studied, deeply practiced, an incredible human being. He's been a great friend to me during some really difficult times. We get into that a little bit here. Can't wait to share it with all of you. So, before we go any further, Heal and Flow is locked in on the calendar March 23 and 24 in Wimberley, Texas. This is just outside Austin in Hill Country on a ranch gonna be our biggest and best yet yoga breath work ice tubs all the good stuff the food the supplements the strong coffee everything you're looking for to elevate your life will have it healing flow March 23 and 24 if you're interested ready to register or just need more details click the link in the show notes as always this episode is sponsored and supported by our brothers at Strong Coffee. Use code EBFLOW at checkout. Get yourself a nice little discount. Also, Raw Optics. Best blue light blocking glasses on the planet. Stylish too, love them. We've all heard the negative effects of artificial light, blue light, too much of it in our sphere these days. Check these out, they're helpful. They're great for the brain, brain health, nervous system health. Finally, Quicksilver Scientific, what can we say? Best adaptogenic elixirs on the planet. Hosted and formulated by my brother, Dr. Chris Shade, who is in this episode. All right, y'all, that's about it. Enjoy it, I'll see y'all soon, peace. You have unlocked the eternal link to internal source, the key of imagination, your admission, access to the enlightened dimension, a gateway at the junction of darkness and light, the place at which the chaos of our conditioned frame of mind give way to a life in constant flux, only to be mastered through vigilant discipline. Peaceful times may come, testing times may go. This is the ebb and flow. Dr. Chris Shade, super grateful to be here with you, man. Grateful to be here. Um, first of all, you're so fucking solid, man. <laughs> Physically, <laughs> mentally, emotionally. I don't know if it's all, if it's all the ginseng or the ashwagandha, <laughs> all the, the ancient herbs and roots that you're taking in, but dude, you're just, I know it's more than that, but you're just so fucking solid from your handshake to how you engage with people. And I'm super grateful to have crossed paths with you, especially when I, when I did, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's a tough time. Yeah. I mean, one thing I wanted, I wanted to start this off. I was driving down here thinking about what are we going to talk about today, dude? You know, what are we going to talk about? You're a fucking wizard. You to me are a true medicine man. And I got to experience that firsthand at. Runga in May of 22, I think it was. Yeah. 
and I was fresh going through a divorce and just completely deconstructing, like falling apart moment to moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it started off, there was this panel that I think the title of it was Follow Your Heart or Following Your Heart. And I shared about what I was going through at that time. Mm -hmm. And after the panel, felt like okay, felt, you know, somewhat together. I took a big hit of THC, Mm -hmm. walked out to this lawn, and all of a sudden it was like my whole life started to fracture. Mm Mm-hmm. The re- my the reality around me just went like, <laughs> and I was doing everything I could to just breathe and feel my feet on the ground. And you were having a conversation somewhere back here, and I'm looking out at this empty field, and it's totally descending on me. This complete breakdown is descending on me. And I start to hear you. I could hear you in conversation, but then you started to do this. This You had this almost convulsing thing that you were doing, this breath, this belly breath thing Mm -hmm. that you were doing. And I was like, why the fuck is Chris doing what I'm feeling right now? Like, what's going on here? And... I made my way, I I just, there was nothing, I couldn't be of any more use to anybody that day, and I found an empty room and just went in there and was sobbing, writhing, felt like my soul was coming out of my body, thought I might have a heart attack, my back hurt, I was holding yoga postures and breathing, and a buddy of mine came in. Gino, and he's like, he was just holding space for me while I was going through this complete breakdown. And I said to him, I was like, go get Dr. Shade. Yep. He'll, he'll, something, it was just intuitive. I I didn't even know exactly what you would do. I wasn't expecting you to bring me anything. I just, that was the first thing that came out of my mouth. I said, go get Dr. Shade. And you came in and you had, Three different CBDs. You had the progesterone yep. serum, which you loaded on my forearms. Yep. You hit me with a mega dose of CBD. And that, with your presence, just everything just quieted down. And you just started talking to me, man. You started talking to me about your own experience dealing with divorce and relationships and like, Eb, you're in a fucking complete state of fight or flight, man. Like your nervous system's flying, your yep. your cortisol, your adrenaline. You think you're in a war right now. Mm-hmm. And you nailed it on the head. And you were my savior that weekend, man. Like totally brought me back together in a time where it w- it felt like I was floating out in the middle of space. Like floating discombobulating into the abyss and had was just like desperately trying to grab the pieces the fragments of myself to hold on to something and it i had already loved you and i'd already had an immense amount of respect for you but something that weekend just how you showed up for me and just just the space you held man Mm -hmm. You know, there was no like, Eb, you got to do this, or Eb, it's got to be like this, or it was just so soothing, and I'm so grateful to you for that, man. And you're you're truly, it was, for me, it was an experience of a true medicine man, like you, and I think what, to me, what that means is a deep, deep sensitivity and honoring of the human being Mm -hmm. and that's what i experienced with you yeah i mean it was i remember when you walked in and i (laughs) got eyes on you i'm like oh fuck and i'm like he's getting a divorce (laughs) nothing can make you look like that and Uh then when you're out out in the field there and i looked at you and and you know Uh this is what happens yeah yeah and i was just with you 
and started going through the healing with mm. you. And it just it just spontaneously happens as long as you're present, coherent, and solid and whole, mm. then you can lend you know, space to somebody else for that energy to come through to them. Uh huh. You know, and yeah, there's substances we use and you know, progesterone, there's nothing like that for bringing down panic. Dude, that was the best anti anxiety yeah. med I had ever taken. Oh, it's stronger than everything. Yeah. Yeah. It was spectacular, dude. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about that, man. I want to talk to you about your journey through your own life and mm-hmm. coming to that. Coming the the knowledge you've acquired, the experiences you've been through that have led to your ability to do that or to tap into that yeah. place in yourself. Yeah, and that's a funny thing. You know, a lot of people, they look at me, uh, like I remember when I first met Kelly Brogan, you know, so radical, uh, radical chicken. Uh-huh. And I'm like, and here's the microdose. And she's like, wait, hold on. And, you know, in no time I had her taking all kinds of shit and she's just like opening way up. But when I first met her, you know, she was like, wait, no, uh, the shaman don't do it like this. And I'm like, look, this is the micro dose. We're slowly opening things up. Uh-huh. And, you know, just in a couple of minutes, the point of the whole thing was she goes, God, I thought you were just going to be this square PhD scientist. Uh-huh. Right? So a lot of people might think that, and, you know, I kind of play that on TV, but then as you get to know me, it's always been a parallel path. I mean, you know, I was, uh, uh, I, you know, started going through high school and into college as a, you know, an agnostic, you know, mm. and I didn't really believe in anything and, uh, and, you know, dropped some acid and had classic <laughs> religious experiences, took a big dose of mushrooms, had complete ego death, all this stuff that people are doing now, uh-huh. you know, this happened in the late eighties to me. And on that first trip, I started seeing energy all around me and I was, I was alone and I'm in the woods and I'm watching the fields of thought hit the plants and come back to me. Uh. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> nothing that I thought is true is true. Uh-huh. And this is the reality. Uh-huh. And from that moment on, I started this parallel path on a spiritual journey. Mm-hmm. And, you know, first it was, you know, Taoism and Zen. And then it was, uh, alchemy and uh, western hermeticism and mm. then came back to uh tibetan buddhism while i was doing a lot more of the taoist work uh i was uh, in a chen style uh that's the old tai chi and qigong lineage from mm. Cal- from uh china and i was with this chinese grandmaster and learning all that stuff and you know started getting into this uh tibetan Dzogchen path and after a lot of work like that, then I had the first Kundalini opening mm. where, and because I'd done, a lot of people have a hard time with Kundalini, like it gets up and gets stuck wherever you're stuck and then uh-huh. fevers and everything. I didn't have any of that because probably because all the Taoist work and, and that opened up my energy heavily. Mm. And from there, I went to some other uh, Tibetan teachers and American teachers and once I had this open energy structure, uh, after a little while, I was watching everybody. You know, I was already in functional medicine, integrative medicine. I was doing mercury detox, making mm. products and stuff. And I was watching all the energy medicine healers. And I was, you know, I was learning from Dietrich Klinghart and the stuff they do there. They do a lot of muscle testing and energy work. And I was sort of, you know, thinking, all right, I'm going to incorporate this stuff at some point. And I'm just watching everybody's system. And uh, then at some point, it just sort of clicked for me. Mm. And uh, I was able to energy test stuff. I muscle test myself with my fingers. And uh, I don't remember the exact sequence. But then I met some healers from, uh, uh, from Europe, from, uh, from Germany and Norway and England. And these guys had this fantastic system using light coming off your body. And mm. reflecting back coherent light and reading light patterns in their muscle testing. And then just spontaneously all this like abdominal churn stuff happens. So if I'm with somebody and we're working on a health concern of theirs uh, and 
we do something that starts moving the energy, then all this stuff just kind of happens. Right. And so then, you know, for a couple of years, I was doing this work on people and this all just sort of developed and it all just automatically happens. Mm. And as long as we're in that space where, you know, we're open with each other, this all just kind of automatically happened. And so I've built, you know, I mean, I have a Tibetan monk that lives at my house. I mean, I have a pretty rich spiritual <laughs> tradition. And it's funny, I walk around and, yeah, you know, I got a little bit of Tibetan right, hanging right. on. But, you know, I don't show that side all uh -huh. that much. And so, you know, when people experience or, it, you know, it comes as a shock. You uh -huh. know, people are like, what? Is yeah. a Tibetan lives at your house? Yeah. 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 Like, I knew you were the mad wizard. I didn't know you were that mad wizard yeah. you know <laughs> which mad wizard is he uh, yeah which is so awesome man how much of it this is something i'm i'm learning and experiencing on my in my own life and my own journey because i'm i i'm hyper empathetic oh you are for an nfl guy it's you crazy. know hyper sensitive yeah. and there's for me there's a lot of letting go of the mind noise around that reciprocity the energetic reciprocity that happens when you come into contact with a person and you're feeling you mean where you have to define it yeah yeah, yeah. like you have to define it or i sort of shrug <laughs> it off or i'm like no or i don't take in that piece of information yeah you know yeah so how much of it how much of your journey and maybe maybe you just sort of immersed yourself to such an extent that, like you said, one day it just blossomed and you yeah. were in the experience of all of it happening at once and going, oh, this is, a, you know, I mean, whatever, whoever it was long yeah. before me, but this is Ebb having a deep nervous response to what he's going through in his life. And I'm feeling that in my body because, of course, why wouldn't we? Yeah. But how much of that did you have that experience of having to let go of your mind? Yeah. Analyzing, logic, logicizing, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, yeah. In my earliest, uh, I mean, even in, you know, the, the big LSD and mushroom journeys, you know, as you're in there, you realize how words and conceptualization. Mm. block the flow of the energy uh -huh. in fact in in yeah. Sog Chen, which is uh it's kind of the pinnacle of the tibetan system and that's uh -huh. what i do we we talk about being in a non-conceptual space you know and the mm. meditation is very different it's not like eyes closed it's eyes open and you're in this big field of awareness and uh. as soon as you start to conceptualize and grasp you start shutting down the field uh, and so uh -huh. I saw that early on and then everything that I, you that's know, power, in the, that's deep, dude. Yeah, uh -huh. it, it's, it's huge and it's so fundamental and it's so freaking easy. Uh huh. Just stop. Right. Just stop, uh -huh. you know, and stop labeling it all and stop conceptualizing it all. Cause as you do, you shut it down. Uh, and, wow. yeah. and so people will be like, that'll start happening to me. It just happens spontaneously. So like, Oh, you're doing something. I'm like, it's doing, uh -huh. I'm not doing you know it's just happening right you know and yes. there's times where i come with, together with somebody i perceive this thing and i know all right we're gonna have an exchange here we're mm. gonna do some work mm -hmm. uh but yeah i don't conceptualize it and i don't decide i mean yeah i know you need some progesterone you need some cbd you need sure. to calm that all down uh-huh but i'm not like you know and then i'm gonna like put yeah. my mind into his spine and do this, you know, and then, uh, you know, you just let it go. I mean, yeah. you know, I might do a mantra here and there to, you know, get a certain kind of energy flowing, but mm. you know, mostly you just gotta, you just gotta be there and open and, and, and aware. And that's what all, yeah. you know, in the, in the meditation paths in, in Tibet, you start with just, well, there's these three levels. We call them all meditation, but they're actually three different things. One's concentration, mm. one's meditation, and the top one is contemplation. Mm. And so concentration, in the beginning, you have to do this. You might focus on one thing. You look at a dot, you look at a Sri Yantra, look at the Tibetan letter A, count your breaths. You're just trying to shut up the monkey mind so it's not uh -huh. running around. It gets used to being still. 
Mm. And then you move into meditation where you're like, oh, I got to meditate on this deity and it's loving compassion and this one's wrathful and this one's medicine. And that's still conceptual, but you're trying to clear away some of your karmas and open up your energy field to feel all this vastness and, and to take these blessings in to elevate yourself. Mm. But then at the top, the contemplation is there, there's no more grasping. There's no more doing. Mm. And the more you try, there's opening and mm. experiencing and awareing around it. And the more you try to do, the more you shut it down. And, uh. you know, so it's, it's really fundamental. And in the end, the shift is, is really easy, but it's hard for us in our dual grasping, clinging, right. binary, ego-driven world where we have to have this explanation around stuff uh -huh. it's, you know it's a classic southern california thing they want an explanation for everything they want <laughs> words around everything they're just dripping these syrupy words out of their mouth all the time <laughs> and it's just like oh, just you need a big dose of shut the fuck up <laughs> yeah dude yeah that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense as far as your lineage and how that got to where you, that that was the platform yeah. that led you to where you are. And it's always been a big thing for me, or at least over the last seven years where my meditation practice and yoga has been such a transformative experience for me, recognizing how limiting words are, mm -hmm. how, how useless it truly is to attempt to constantly be conceptualizing everything and wrapping yeah. identification markers around everything that we're coming into contact with and experiencing. And I feel like that's, that's one of the super limiting aspects of science in general is this oh, yeah. need to just label it and identify it all. The reductionist thing it's, you know, words and reductionist science are both totally necessary for evolving us and for communicating and at right. the same time they <laughs> can be totally useless and defeating uh -huh. and so you know one of the things with stopping doing so much is understanding and accepting paradox mm. it's all around you uh -huh. you know one of my spiritual friends and i used to say is it this or it that and the answer was it's both mm. it's mm -hmm. both at one time yeah. it always is uh -huh. you know yin and yang are never separate, never, never come all the way together. You know, they're always, you know, that yin and yang wheel rolling. You know, the faster it rolls, the more tightly interleaved the, the white and the black get, but they're always separated. And, you know, I even talk about that, you know, and talking about cell membranes and, and health and biological powers from this constant separation of opposites and letting them have their power and their opposition. Uh -huh. and not having to resolve them and not because it's all paradox. It's all two things all at once, all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And so if you just go and like, well, science sucks, it's like, right. well, you know, you should throw away this house you're in and the car you're in and these mics and your clothes and everything. Yeah. And you can walk around like a fucking ape if that's what you want to do, you know, but science has gotten us here. Uh -huh. And then blind allegiance to it is complete folly, too. So uh -huh. they both have to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, dude. That's that's so that's such an important shift in perspective. It's like recognizing the paradox, recognizing, allowing. I love allowing. what you said. Allowing the power of things in their opposition. Yeah, it's a really powerful thing. Yeah, yeah, and you that's know. how everybody likes using the term alchemy. Oh, it's I'm a food alchemist. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> alchemy is. Allowing the power and the opposition and mm. using that power to start elevating things and uh -huh. evolving your consciousness or evolving the medicines that you're working with. Mm. And then eventually you get into the metals alchemy and stuff. But all that, you know, getting to those perfect medicines and the stone and stuff is all depend on you getting there. Mm. And so they're always opposites are core of alchemy. Love that, dude. So shifting gears a little bit, I'm sure we'll we'll stay in the vein of all of these topics, power of opposites and yin and yang and darkness and light. 
But you, as a young man, you ventured into regenerative biodynamic farming. Yeah. And you you spent a lot of time in there, and it was the, I I know the story because the last time we were on a podcast together with Cal, yeah. You shared about how that took you to be this speaker at Disney World, or <laughs> in a, and that whole thing. But what I'm really interested in is the journey into understanding and utilizing these super powerful ancient adaptogenic roots and herbs and mm -hmm. the things that you put in all your products. And just like, how did that, and, and once again, I think you started off with it. These were parallel paths. Yeah. And it's all part of who you are and your journey and what you've done and what you've brought to the world with Quicksilver and just you as a human being. But I'm curious how, like, where that interest started and in starting to learn about these things. Yeah, it goes back to that big acid trip again, of course. <laughs> you know, I, I... How you know, old were you when you a freshman you, in college? So like nineteen. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and then uh, that sort of broke me out of everything, and I was right. fascinated with this energetic aspect of the universe. And I started smoking weed, and uh, <laughs> and then of course I started growing weed. Now this is back in like the Reagan Bush years. You know, you can go up the river for that stuff. Uh -huh. I was on the East Coast. And, uh huh. You know. <laughs> got a hold of these Amsterdam seeds and some high-end lights and then I'm growing this stuff in my closet and then I get obsessed with how does this stuff grow and mm. hey let me try organic and soon I was developing these organic ebb and flood hydroponic systems mm. and uh, then somebody gives me this book from Rudolf Steiner oh. and because I knew I was getting I was just starting to get into this spiritual stuff and try to figure this stuff out and uh, so I read this Steiner stuff, and he's the guy who developed biodynamics. And right. So that led to understanding that. And I left school, traveled around for two years. I was sailing. I was going up to Alaska, finding myself, starting to read these books, and then came back, Fucking finished epic, school. <laughs> and then I'm like, I'm going to go start an organic farm because – then when I was growing weed, I figured out how to get some of these uh, biodynamic preps and start applying them to the weed. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I'm going to go be a biodynamic farmer. And uh, my aunt and uncle had some land up in Massachusetts, and it was just trashy, acid, sandy pine land. And I'm like, I'll transform it into the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and went up there and started doing that and started using biodynamics. And there you're learning, you know, these polarities again you've got this downward earthy energy that you're that you're mm. building up to grow roots and leaves and thick stems and then you're getting that so that's this sort of lunar earthy energy and then you're flipping the pole and you're driving upward airy solar energy mm. to have these things come up and flower and and make fruit and that was a great application to the weed i really learned how to moderate those energies and uh, and just started using energetic tools then. And there was a great book at the time called Secrets of the Soil, and uh. it was documenting all these guys using all these energy techniques on the land uh, from, you know, towers that project, you know, you plug them into ley lines and they project energy around mm. to radionics stuff to uh, sound and light aspects mm. and the biodynamics. So we started doing all this energy medicine on the land mm. and the whole you know i got certified as an organic farmer before this usda organic you had to prove that you were really a soil ecologist uh. that you were building the soil and and so you had to be feeding the soil and the whole thing was creating this big microbiome inner ecosystem everything we talk about in our guts now mm. was you know in the soil and that was you would compost old stuff and cultivate the good bacteria and you're always bringing organic matter into the soil you're bringing ground rock into the soil then you're bringing all these energies in and so i learned a lot about what eventually uh, you know i manifest this all now as understanding sort of the systems biology in the person and mm. how do we bring together the various inputs and how do we clarify everything and so 
Uh, my aunt and uncle got divorced, and so I lost that land. Oh, wow. And you know, one thing led to another. We tried, uh, we we tried to start a farm down in Pennsylvania. And so, you know, I used to drop this line on podcasts like this. And, oh, and I ended up going back to school because this little old lady got shot in the head. Oh, that's like what? this horrible freaking story, right? What? You know, really weird, you know. And we were trying to start this farm. And uh, it was on my friend's father-in-law's land. Mm. And this father-in-law's son, so this guy's stepbrother, was in his garage flashing his piece to his friend and it goes off and it goes through a wall off a tree off a house right through this woman's head what crazy what crazy turn like and it turned out it was like the only one in the world that loved him and you know he would take her garbage out all the time he'd fix her house and do everything it was like you never know how this stuff's going to go. That's like kind of dark. Yeah. And so we shut that all down and I did a stint as a stonemason for a little bit. And then I went to the <laughs> Rodale Institute. Yeah. And I learned Scottish uh, random rubble. Of masonry course you did, dude. Scottish master mason. <laughs> so, of course, dude. Of course, you know. Of so you did that. I was doing that, <laughs> and, uh -huh. then, and then that was killing my back. And I was doing a lot of like water gardens, and then uh, you know, uh, walls and restoration uh -huh. work and stuff. And it was just killing me. So I was like, I got to do something else, mm. and uh, and I got an internship with the Rodale Institute, uh -huh. and they do organic farming. And okay. I was, you know, I did my internship there and I wanted to get a job there, but you know, I'm this noisy, loud swinging dick. And it was just <laughs> like, you know, it's like, I really didn't belong in organic farming uh -huh. <laughs> and certainly not in the research of organic farming. And they're like, you should go down and do this program at Epcot center where we're going to do outreach and you're going to talk to people about the beauty of composting and the cycle of life and all that. And that's how I went down there and they taught me public speaking. They trained me for weeks with all kinds of coaches, public speaking coaches, acting education coaches, science education coaches, dude, and then I gave the same talk four times a day on the floor of Epcot for six weeks. And that's where I learned. Fuck, to they speak. still need that. Do they still do that? I don't, probably not. That was the 25th anniversary of their flower and garden show. And oh, interesting. So they yeah. had all this agriculture from around the world. Uh -huh. we, were, we were regenerative agriculture. Wow, dude. What a trip, man. Yeah, it has been. <laughs> <laughs> so from there. What what happened next? I mean, how long were you at Epcot Center giving these talks four oh, times a day? Six months. Uh huh. You know, I was there, and uh, and they had me housed in this like gated in condo community with, you know, all these like eighteen to twenty five year olds right, right. from all over the world, and then there's a couple of us, you know, like. 30 year old farm researchers and we're like, Hey, this is nice. And then my <laughs> eyes spot this woman, you know, with long black hair and, you know, Mediterranean skin, the sun behind her kind of see through skirt. And I'm like that <laughs> I'm getting that. And I just, you know, tracked her down. Uh -huh. And I remember just going to the, I was at the pool once and all these, uh, Icelanders were, were there. Maybe they were Norwegians, and they're in the hot tub, and this guy, Torbjorn, saying, Ah, oh, Nadine is going to come tonight to the pool for my birthday. And I'm like, that's the one. <laughs> so I go out and smoke this big joint and come back, and I start wrapping her up. And I'm like, you know, we just call it the freedom rap. You know, I'm giving her the whole, you know, got to be free rap. And, and she's just like deer in the headlights, and she goes home, and she says to her roommates, if this guy named Chris calls, I'm not here. <laughs> and, you know, then I tracked her down again and uh, got her to go on a date with me on April Fool's Day. Oh, my God. And, uh, you know, turn on this big long walk where we adopted a dog for an evening. And uh, so she eventually nice became my date. wife. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow, dude. And so then I was married. So then I had to get a job. Right, and right. And so I went back to grad school. I'm like, 
you know, this farming thing isn't working out. A joke that I got out of farming the year the Whole Foods was formed. Uh, uh-huh. You know, there was no money in it back then. Uh-huh. And uh, so then I went back. I got a master's uh, around agricultural pollution. And then I went to get a Ph.D., and I went to University of Illinois thinking I was going to look at agriculture and pollution. I thought, this is the most boring shit in the world, and these guys aren't all that smart. And they brought me to talk to this, you know, brilliant kind of troubled genius. Uh, it was an MIT PhD that worked uh, there. was a professor, and he did mercury, global mm. cycling of mercury. And I'm like, now this dude's smart, and this is interesting. Mm. And he said, you good in the lab? I'm like, sure am. He said, can you develop me a mercury speciation system? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> and I just went to work, you know, big barring, stealing equipment from all of all the old guys, all the old labs in, uh, in the department, and oh. developed out the testing for the, the stuff we call the mercury tri test now. Mm. And that was first environmental. And then I wanted to get back into people. And so we applied it to uh, looking at fish based and amalgam based mercury in people mm. and patented that in grad school. And, you know, at the same time, parallel path, I was studying all this Tai Chi and Taoism. I got turned on to the Buddhism there. I was doing alchemy around gold. People call like white powder gold, enormous gold. You mm. buy these, you know, lower levels of it up in Santa Monica and Venice now. But I was doing all that parallel and got my PhD, got my patent, and the university wanted me to go start a company to commercialize the patent. And so that is how I started Quicksilver Scientific. And I, my spiritual wow, teacher, dude. Dennis Waterman, was like, you're going to move to Boulder. And I'm like, yeah, old man, whatever. How do you know I'm going to move to Boulder? I'm going to move where I'm going to move. When I found the job, I'm going to find <laughs> and he's like, hey, you're going to move to Boulder. <laughs> and so I tried like everything under the sun and nothing's working. And then I'm like, all right, I do have a friend out in Boulder and I do think it's probably cool. And I'm going to move out there, but I'm going to work for the university. And eventually I'm going to start my company. He's like, yeah, right, whatever. And so <laughs> I moved out. I couldn't get anything. And I had no choice but to start Quicksilver Scientific. And yep, there I was in, in outside of Boulder. Uh-huh. And I'm like, oh, this is absolutely where I should be. Uh-huh. It, you, you're still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Uh-huh. Louisville, Lafayette, they're outside of Boulder. I'm, I'm really curious about Mercury. And uh, <clears throat> I feel like in this day and age, we, like, my generation doesn't know a whole lot about Mercury yeah. because... It was already identified as being toxic and, you know, for fillings and all this other stuff. But quit. Mercury has been around for a really long time. And there's been. Well, yeah, since the dawn. Uh, of yeah, time. yeah. It's I, geologic. But I mean, as far as like humans interacting with it. Yeah. You know. Uh, and why? They, like, what is it? So there's you go way, 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 way back. And uh, the Chinese and. Uh, Indian alchemists used a lot of different metals and they used mercury a lot. Mm. And it's notoriously difficult to work with in those medicinal spaces where you can make it where it's totally non-toxic or you can kill yourself. Mm. And uh, the European alchemists used a ton of it and you know a lot of them you know, died of mercury poisoning. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, there's all these people they've dug up and, you know, tested them and they're a truck full of mercury. They're al- alchemists and stuff. Interesting. Uh, and it was used in medicine, the Chinese and the Ayurvedics to power up this system. But in, uh, in Europe, they were using it as an antimicrobial and they would use it for syphilis. It's really good for killing syphilis if it doesn't kill you. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and there was a lot of controversy on how to use it and if it's good or if it's bad. A lot of people like Paracelsus was like, you're crazy if you use it. And he actually came up with the term, a quack. Oh. A quack is somebody uses quacksalber, quicksilver, oh. mercury. Quacksalber, quicksilver means liquid mercury. Right, right. And the German was quacksilver. And anybody who uses mercury in medicine is a quack. And it was a negative connotation. Uh. And then 
Fast forward a couple hundred years, and these dentists, these French guys in the late 1800s, they were trying to figure out a better way to fill cavities in. They used to have to pack gold leaf in there, and it would take forever, and it was too expensive for for most people. Uh And they figured out that you could mix mercury and silver together and just push it into this little void. And, yeah, you know, maybe 1870, that's a decent technology, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> and there's immediately, they, they talk about the three world wars in, in dentistry, and there were the three amalgam wars. Mm. And uh, right then there was a big split, and people were like, are you out of your minds putting mercury into people's mouth? Why in the world would you do that? And there was the American College of Dental Surgeons and another group, and they split over this issue and the one that were like, yeah, let's do that ended up sort of taking over Mm. and then they made amalgam. Okay. And then, you know, and it wasn't, it was really stupid. And then, you know, decades later there was another split over that. And now we're in the last one. We're finally getting rid of it, but unfortunately we're getting rid of it. Not originally because people were like, Oh, that's toxic. They're like, no, I don't want the gray fillings. I want the white ones, which are the composites right, right. we put in now. We put like epoxy in there now. Uh-huh. Uh, and so that's kind of why it's gone away. But now on the world stage, uh, it's being phased out everywhere. And they, they just had a ruling uh, in Europe where it's going to be phased out of all dental use uh, in Europe. So, What's the significance of it? So, mm-hmm. you know, mercury is is a wicked and weird toxin. Mm. It attacks your body in a, in a number of different ways. Mm. Uh, but the worst is probably what it does to the nervous system. And it's known like the term mad as a hatter. Mm. When you start getting enough mercury into your brain... Uh, yeah, you could have like variations in your uh, visual field and auditory problems and taste problems, but it acts on the glutamate receptors, which mm. are what make you anxious. And so the early symptoms of it are anxiety. You're always kind of like wiry and up there. Uh, but eventually it kind of makes you paranoid. Mm. And you. This is one of the problems with toxicity is... Once it roots in you, especially mercury, you start having these patterns in your mind that are helping you stay away from the answer. Uh. So I would see early on people would come to me and you could see they're all like tweaky and they're coming up and they're like, oh, Dr. Shane, I just want to ask you, I got so many symptoms and... (laughs) You know, I was just wondering if, you know, and I'm like, yes, it's mercury. I can see it all over you, you know, and then you'd, you'd tell them yes. And they're like, what do you do about it? I'm like, well, I got the answer. Here's what you do. You take this, this and this, and they would just run away. So uh, they're always getting in the way of the solution. This is problem with toxicity. It does that. Certain ones do that a lot. Mercury does that. It makes it very hard to get it all out of your body because you resist doing it. Mm. the farther it gets into you. Uh-huh. That's really interesting. Is there any in this in this this idea of yin and yang, positive and negative, the polarity of the universe, are there any benefits to mercury? Does it do anything positive? Like you said, in Ayurveda, they would use it to power up the system. How was that? There's a lot of different ways they used it. Uh, now, there's a couple of things here. Is I'm sure there is some benefit in there. Sometimes there are hormetic benefits. Hormetic means what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh huh. And so a it's lot, like an ice tub or a sauna. Yeah, like, creates yeah. that hermetic a, response. A lot of the compounds that I put in my products are hermetic. Like they'll go in and they'll be like a little microtoxin to the uh-huh. cell, and they'll upregulate this pathway called NRF2, which is the cell's detoxification pathway. Right. Right. You know. And so I'm using lipoic acid and quercetin mm. uh, and curcumin to activate that. But arsenic and mercury activate it as well. Mm. So they do like turn on a response to it, but they have all these side effects. Uh-huh. And when you're chronically exposed to it coming out of your mouth all the time, you tem- tend to respond to those effects. Mm. Now, I'm sure that there's some things that it does in the nervous system. And, you know, the body does have... 
in that like white gold alchemy, you're shifting a metal from this metallic state to this non-metallic state where uh-huh. it starts integrating in your nervous system. And, you know, the idea is that it makes you super sensory and hypercharges your nervous system. You start having, you know, more of the, the Kundalini and the mystical aspects of the nervous system. Uh-huh. I do believe it, it does some of that, but there's probably better ways to do it. Now, uh-huh. when you get into the alchemy around mercury, what's really cool is that you have to purify the mercury before you use it. Uh. Because the mercury is an infinite absorber of samskaras, patterns. Mm. Everybody's toxic negative patterns Mm. get attached to it. Mm. And those patterns, those loops start to establish themselves in your consciousness. Mm. Now, if you take the mercury and completely purify away all of its samskaras, and then put it in a form where you're not going to absorb it into your cells, but it'll go through your intestines. It will then suck your samskaras, Mm. your negative patterns into it, and you ship them out. Mm. And so uh, that's, you know, the general path of using mercury and alchemy is uh, in that alchemical medical aspect is to purify away all its defilements, then make it into a form often it's like cinnabar that goes through your stomach and sucks the bad out of you. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Then there's some other combinations of gold and sulfur in it that do other things. And I've been in contact with a couple of uh, gurus over in India that you know claim to know these higher paths of taking mercury all the way up to these super high forms. Uh. And they're just dying for me to like come over there and do it. They're like, you're a mercury PhD. Oh my God, this is the best. And you know, this one of them... Uh, I forgot his name right now. He, he wants to come over to the to the lab and visit, and you know, you know talk do some mercury. meditations, talk talk mercury. You know, interesting, dude. It's the other the other part of that question would be in nature or in the universe, even you know, more more macrocosmic perspective. There's you know, positive and negative. So is mercury just a poison and what would be the other end of the spectrum uh, super medicine you know like a uh-huh. alchemical regenerative medicine uh-huh yeah so it has those two it definitely has the poison pole and it has this potential uh as this super restorative and uh-huh. that you know when i get done clearing mercury out of everybody i'm gonna go <laughs> how many make people mercurials i even got one recently and you know oh, remember really? mindy was like are you out of your mind? I'm like, <laughs> have some faith, huh? <laughs> Trust. Have you, how many people today are walking around with two high levels of mercury? A lot? Uh, a lot. Now, your, your two main forms you're getting it from it used to be vaccines, amalgams, and fish. Uh huh. Now it's amalgams and fish, but amalgams are going away. Uh huh. And so it kind of depends if you're older, you'll have them. If you're younger, you'll have the white fillings. Uh-huh. And if you're poor, you'll have them because, you know, Medicaid only lets you put mercury in your mouth. They won't Perfect. pay to have non toxic <laughs> alternatives into your mouth. Oh, no, it's wonderful. Uh, so, you know, anyone who has the amalgams has a potential issue from it. Those, mm. those are really bad. There's one form you're swallowing all the time that's polluting your liver GI system and the way you detoxify. Then the other form you're inhaling and that's polluting your brains, polluting your cells, mm. blowing up mitochondria, blowing out your kidneys, mm-hmm. uh, blowing out your thyroid. But fish has become sort of the largest source. And now we're, you know, we're down in Southern California. You got a lot of that. You guys Uh are eating a lot of fish down here. And it's not like all fish are the same. The fish higher up on the food chain have the highest amount of mercury in it. Mm. So swordfish, big tuna, shark, have 10,000 times more mercury than a sardine or a kipper or an anchovy Uh or even the, you know, the, uh, you know, small any small white fish or even small uh salmon they're all pretty low so Uh when you go up high is when you get it you know and it's funny you know you you probably know i i did the mercury detox for tony robbins Mm. and tony robbins went from being did you really yeah because he was like fucked up yeah no i was the guy who did him 
Oh my God! Yeah, dude. Sage of course, gets, bro. gets me out. <laughs> and it, you'll hear it on some of the podcasts. You know, like, yeah, it's got Doctor Shade, Quicksilver Scientific, and yeah, dude, his, his I love wife that. Shade, uh, his wife Sage found me, and uh, but he went from being a vegan yeah. to being paleo, and you know those guys they are all like eating from you know the vegetable. They can't go to the hoof, right, can't moo right. and stuff, so they go to the fin. Uh huh. And uh-huh. He was eating tons of fish. He yeah, about and this. you know, and uh, a guy and his team had this mistaken notion that higher up on the food chain, you're higher away from the ocean floor, right, and the right. ocean floor is where all the heavy metals sink to. But it's actually quite the opposite. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, cadmium and arsenic are down there, but mercury is up at the top. And he was eating swordfish and tuna, flown in from Hawaii, a nice spiritual center, highest mercury levels on the planet for the uh, fish. And he was just eating that all day long. Uh-huh. And uh, he drove his levels up to 125 parts per billion, where the 95th percentile is like seven. And wow. so he was screaming high, losing memory, fatigued, crushed all the time. And... Uh, and so we fixed him from that, but a lot of, you know, there was, before I did him, uh, there was a CEO and this came in through, uh, Dale Bredesen does a lot of, uh, early cognitive decline, Alzheimer's work. And he had this guy who was 56 and have an early cognitive decline, all kinds of problems mm. and also metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, blood sugar problems and stuff. And he did all the normal, like feed in all the good stuff for your brain. It didn't do jack for him. And somebody said, hey, you, you know, you should measure your mercury levels. Uh. And uh, and he went to a doctor, he uses our test, and they sent in a test. It was super, super high. And the guy came to me with Bredesen, and Bredesen said, all right, you do your work and send him back. And we got all the mercury out of him, and oh, he's done. He's better. His brain's fixed. Wow. His metabolic syndrome, his fatty liver is all gone. And uh, wow, and dude. from then on, Bredesen changed all of his his teaching and he says you know toxins and chronic infection are the biggest thing causing you know decay of the brain i was just gonna ask you that yep like how much of that how how big of an impact does the things like mercury toxicity and other things like that have to do or link to neurodegenerative diseases it, it's huge uh-huh. and probably there's a lot of work around mycotoxins, mold toxins, right, driving right. neurological issues, but all the toxins have potential for having a lot of neurological disruption. And a bunch have a ton of it. So mm. the metals are really bad up there. Uh, a lot of the pesticides, herbicides, flame retardants all go up there. Uh, but the mold toxins are super, super bad for the brain. Mm. And you, you start driving this pattern of chronic neuro inflammation Uh which is uh it's a feedback loop between the immune system in your brain and the neurons in your brain a lot of people don't realize you have an immune system in your brain uh they're called microglia and they're usually there for synaptic pruning and like reordering your neural net you know Mm. you get somebody to take a huge dose of uh psychedelics and reset their default mode network and then the microglia go all go to work helping you repattern uh. but then when you throw a bunch of toxins in and when you especially when you get endotoxin in there's something that we get from leaky gut mm. uh it start the microglia start being like peripheral immune cells and attacking the brain like it's trying to kill it like it's a bacteria mm. and so this feedback loop goes and that locks you into sympathetic autonomic tone, the fight or flight tone. Mm. And once that happens, you're <laughs> you downregulate all of your healing mechanisms. Uh-huh. So you know, sympathetic fight or flight. This is all I'm going to do is get away from the tiger, get away from the fight. Right. Parasympathetic rest, digest, repair, regenerate, detoxify. Uh-huh. That's the chill one. Yeah. That's where you go with the progesterone, with the CBD, with the GABA, with the breathing. Mm. But the toxins get in there and they shift you away from that. And that turns down your own detox system uh-huh. and turns down regeneration. And then that's going to turn down things like autophagy where you're break, breaking up old dead cells and old dead mitochondria and you shift into this pro-inflammatory 
downward spiral. Uh -huh. You know, I give a talk at A4M, certs over SIPs, certs are sirtuins, and these things, you know, we, you know, we activate them with like resveratrol and crestin, and these are longevity programs in the body. They control inflammation. Uh -huh. They control uh you know old cells get rid of senescent cells when you're on that path you're clearing things away and you're managing inflammation having the right inflammation having the right signaling everything's good then sips are their antithesis you mm. know so that's the dark lord uh -huh. and sips yeah, stand yeah. for shitty inflammatory processes <laughs> <laughs> now there's a more you know legit word stressed induced premature senescence but once that inflammation starts happening and you start creating these cells that are not propagating anymore and they're spreading inflammation and they spread signals that suck down your NAD levels. And that's a senescent cell. A senescent cell. That's like a zombie cell. The zombie cell. Uh -huh. And they start secreting these pro-inflammatory cytokines that can recruit other cells into senescence. Uh -huh. That's bringing you downward. And uh, they activate this thing called CD38, which starts consuming all of your NAD. Mm. And then your NAD levels go down, and then your mitochondria are starved, and then the sirtuins get even further shut down. And so you just start moving into this inflammatory downward spiral. Oh. And then you're never going to heal your brain, and the whole system's going to start going down from there. So toxins, like right at the core of this negative spiral interesting man makes so much sense really makes so much sense and i i learned that from you when i learned that from you a few years ago about detoxification being a component of the parasympathetic nervous system yep and when you think about it you know the fact that most people are walking around in a completely stressed state, yeah. living in the sympathetic because yeah. of the toxins, because of their lifestyle. And in the don't... sympathetic, chronically accumulating toxins. Yes, yes. And I mean, man, you know, so it goes deeper than, you know, obviously you've got to get your lifestyle in order. When yeah. you when you get into that place of that downward pro, yeah. that downward spiral into hyperinflammation yeah so you got to get your lifestyle in order and then it's it's this very nuanced and and interesting exploration of like okay how how many toxins am i carrying around how inflamed is my liver what are my hormones like all of yep. that stuff and then yeah and that phase is the phase to open mm. how do i open mm. love that dude and in the old healing language, uh, European and the homeopaths, we called it drainage. Mm. How do we open the liver to drain? Uh, How do we open the kidneys to drain? Uh huh. How do we open the lymph to drain? Because I suppose when you're locked up in that fight or flight state, and all you can do, all your all your being can do is worry about surviving. Yeah. Everything is like this. Yeah. Everything's locked down. Your yeah. blood vessels, your organs, everything is just like. And specifically for detoxification, when you're in the sympathetic, you shut down bile flow. Mm. So mm. the liver, we know the liver's cleaning all the toxins out of the blood, but what's it doing with them? Uh huh. It's dumping them in the bile, the gl green liquid that drains out of the liver into the upper GI that we think of for uh, emulsifying and digesting fats. Mm. But that's the toxin flow is going through there. Mm -hmm. And so when mm. you lock up bioflow, you'll be not hungry, right? Sympathetic fight or flight is not rest, digest. It's not eating time. Uh -huh. And so it locks detoxification down. Uh -huh. And so that's a very fundamental closedness that happens there. Yeah. And is very literally locking in all the toxins mm. that are then furthering the glutamate firing in the brain. Glutamate and GABA are your fundamental opposites in neurotransmission. Mm. Glutamate, yeah, we need glutamate because it makes us on. It makes us vigilant. It makes us remember previous dangers. Mm. It makes us know what we're going to do for the day. Mm -hmm. But remembering and danger 
And overcycling of that is fear and anxiety. Uh -huh. So when that's going too much, anxiety is going. Mm. Then GABA is the opening mm. side. It is the rest and digest, the peace and love, the Zen neurotransmitter. And, you know, these are fundamental opposites and one's sympathetic and one's parasympathetic. And you need to be going back and forth between those. Mm -hmm. And really there, we're, we're saying that your mind has to be able to open up for the rest of you to open up. Mm. And yeah, we can use some things that help us, you know, the hormones and the CBD and the GABA and stuff. But really, permanently, we have to shift our mindset where we're seeing danger in everything. Uh huh. My God, there's my wife. She's going to get me. You know? <laughs> oh my God, there's my employees. They want something. Uh -huh. Oh my God, the FDA's here. Well, that is dangerous. Oh my God, there's a bill. Uh huh. You know? Uh huh. Yeah. And, and we're reacting to everything out of that space. And we have to relax, open up, and allow and be not so attached to the outcome of every moment. Mm. You have to realize it just is being. We are just being. We think we're making efforts, but is the universe just unfolding us and we're expanding and doing our things so that God can see the manifestation of all of his options and all of his possibilities is coming through each one of our individualities. Who says I'm running this? <laughs> That's it, bro. That's it. Totally, man. And so then when, the stress comes off. <laughs> uh, totally. Totally. I feel less stressed just hearing that. Yeah. I mean, that's how I live my life. But if, when you articulate it in that way, it's just like, oh, yeah, I could just take a breath, man. The yeah. sun's shining. It's a beautiful day out here. I can try twice as hard and really nothing's probably going to change at all. Uh-huh. So when, when somebody comes to you and they're, they're in that red line, yeah. You're totally redlined. Yeah. What's the first step? Either for your protocol or if it was a friend or somebody. Yeah, no, that's you know, I'm like, trying to sort of integrate all of the different yeah, options yeah. there. You know, especially you see that red line is like in their nervous system. Uh huh. You know, because some people are just like blown out tired. Sure. And, you know, then we're going to open up liver and kidney, get the binders in there, start flowing things out, get the mitochondria and the energy back up. But the uh -huh. ones who are got that sympathetic going, mm. we got to we got to pet that. Uh -huh. <laughs> we got to pet them right. and bring that stuff down. We have to bring it to their attention that they're in that state. Mm. And mm -hmm. then, you know, CBD, GABA, progesterone depends what tool you use with which person. Mm -hmm. but that's always, I mean, it's not always a, a part of our protocols, but when the nervous system is activated, those compounds are always part of the protocols. We learned that with autism. Oh. We learned to build detox that was powerful and pretty symptom free by, by working with autism where they would go sideways left and right. Their immune and nervous systems are so tweaked that that's why they're always stimming and stuff like uh -huh. that. That's constant neuroinflammation. And that's constantly blocking the liver. And uh. that's constantly accumulating the toxins. And the toxins are down-regulating the immune system. And they're bringing all the viruses in. And so mm. we got to soothe. We Like in a sequence of dosing, we'll give CBD, GABA, progesterone, whatever we're bringing them down with. Mm. And then we give them the stuff to open up the liver, open up the kidney, then the stuff starts to flow out. It gives you a little safe passage mm. in the nervous system and the immune system, actually, because uh, there's cannabinoid and GABA receptors on the immune cells, too. And so that helps mm. just calm and cool everything. And then we get some of those toxins out, bind them up in the GI. And once we sequence it like that, calm the system, you open up the toxin flow and couple it to the bile flow, and then you throw in the binders and pick them up when they get down there. And the That's binders are charcoal or clay. Charcoal, clays, uh -huh. you know, other ones that are more specific for different uh -huh. toxins. Because once you dump them into the GI, you reabsorb a lot of them. So once you do that, calm, drop out with the bile, pick it up with the binders, you end up with these nice little discreet cycles of detox. Hmm. You know, once a day, twice a day, three times a day. And you really start being able to offload all this stuff from the system. Now, you know... I'm also going to recommend that they, they got to do some lifestyle stuff. Uh -huh. They got 
you know, and we'll have like time and, you know, you're going to take your liver sauce and kidney and stuff. They got a half hour until you take your binder. How about you do something mindful now? <laughs> yeah. You got 30 minutes. Uh-huh. You know, work with some gratitude, some deep breathing. That deep breathing is the easiest way to shift yourself mm. into parasympathetic. Maybe you'll be in a sauna. Maybe you can do some Tai Chi, some yoga. It's a time while these things are in you, when you have that intention and that action of making the lifestyle go along with the chemistry uh -huh. that really helps build the proper path in to the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I love you, man. Love you. I love your perspective and your awareness of and how how you bring to the surface the the interconnectedness of the spiritual, the mental, the emotional and the physical. How the physiology is a reflection of the spiritual body, yeah. you know, and all the way through. Yeah. And it's like it's all linked, man. Like the closed off organs has to do with the closed off mental yes. psychology, you know? Yeah. I think that's a really powerful thing because we've come up in a society that's conditioned us to compartmentalize everything. Yeah. Like everything is so, like, you know, my body, my physical health is here and my mental health is over there and I go to church to get God. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And everything is just like in its little it's container. Yeah. You know, and it's like, God, you're just making it so hard, you know? Yeah. You know, it, it does close us off from everything. And uh -huh. even the way we compartmentalize God, you know, we don't, you know, the, the problem with Christianity is it doesn't give you a relationship to God. It has an intermediary. Right. It has the priest. It has the church. You know what I mean? Some some Christians, you know, have this you know direct experience, but sure. uh, a lot of them are, are broken off. And a lot of us are you know, are very compartmentalized away from our spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's not able to flow through and inform us and tell us, oh, this is what's going on in our field and with these people around here. Uh -huh. And yeah, I mean, that's that's a compartmentalization that holds everything back. Uh huh. Yeah, a thousand percent, man. A thousand percent. What are you... What are you most excited about right now? Like, what's really turning you on right now in, in the field of products or, you know, supplements or anything you're doing in your life? Like, yeah. what's, what are you really stoked up about right now? Uh, I feel like the last time or, you know, when, when you were my savior over the weekend, you were the, the hormones. Yeah had been the new thing that you yeah. were really excited about and interested in. Yeah. And I'm I'm still super stoked on that. It's a slow roll opening up to the world because of people's fear sure. of hormones because of some uh, wrongfully done bad press a couple decades ago about something called the Women's Health Initiative. And so people oh, think they're all getting cancer from hormones. And so the women, they suffer so much as they go into perimenopause and then menopause, and the hormones just right the ship, level the ship, and they feel freaking great. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I love that gift of bringing that, renewed vitality to women mm. you know i was giving a talk to doctors last night and they're like so why'd you do all this female hormone stuff and i said you ever hear the term happy wife happy life <laughs> nobody ain't nobody happy if mom's not happy uh -huh. i find if i fix a lot of women the whole world gets a lot better and i love that so I, I really yeah i mean i I love women and uh, I love their energy. I love their glow. I love what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I hate to see that light go out when uh -huh. you bring it back down. It's just great for everybody. Totally, so, man. That's still hot. Uh, and, and we're doing a big, we got a whole online uh, 
courses about teaching the practitioners how to use these things and how mm. to do that. And so that's all going to launch in the next uh, month or two. So there's a big mode of education right now around the hormones. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the wall you got to get over. Uh -huh. you got to educate the doctors to be comfortable with it, and they sure. got to educate the patients to be com comfortable about it. Uh -huh. uh, and But, you know, once they start doing it, oh, my God, the, the reviews you get back, it's like – it just changes their lives. Uh -huh. and it's, and it's a beautiful thing to be able to have those uh, available now. But there's some other stuff we're doing. Probably the three hot things. There's that. There's post-COVID has been a disaster for people. And so many people are really sick. And there's these chronic circulatory issues. Mm. Uh, you know, did this come from the virus? Did it come from the vaccines? What's going on in there? There's a lot of weird stuff uh, in the microscopy of the blood mm. uh, that we're seeing now. And so these people that have that, you know, how do you break that all down? And there's a combination of resurfaced chronic infections. You know, we talk about a microbiome in our gut, but we have a microbiome inside of us and they're living in these biofilms and there are all mm. kinds of different creatures that are basically negative, but you have them sort of at bay. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> after different immune suppressing events like COVID was, they'll come out of the they'll come out of the cave and start running things. So you've got this uh. combination of these chronic infections i mean these could be all lime like organisms they could be viral organisms there's a lot of aquatic parasites and funguses that live in us so there's a mixture of these things up there's hypercoagulability the blood cells all sticking together mm. uh and you know these cardiomyopathies and stuff and so i've been working on trying to reverse those mm. uh with like that cardio formula uh -huh. we have that we have a new version of that that drops blood pressure down, you know, 10, 20 points in 10 minutes. That's amazing. And that's been huge for these people. And then we add in, I've got a new antimicrobial, uh, we loosely call crypto claw, because uh, <laughs> it's got cryptolepsis and cat's claw and artemisinin in it. And it handles these chronic things really, really well. Mm. Uh, and uh, an EDTA, which was used as a metal chelator but it's also got biofilm breaking aspects it's uh nitric oxide upregulating it's anticoagulant mm. and so it's been really of great use so those three there in those tricky you know post-covid sort of long hauler type of things has been helpful in in you know super helpful in those therapies then <laughs> we're gonna start doing uh, sublingual nanoliposomal peptides. Oh, wow, dude. That's yeah. cool. How yeah. is that? How is, how is the delivery? I mean, I've only taken peptides either injected or combo. I mean, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, so how are you going to get it in there? And, then, you know, it's uh, my normal bag of tricks. Uh -huh. You're know, going to make these little lipid nanoparticles and they're going to go right across the oral cavity and the capillaries and the circulation. They'll, you know, be absorbed in the stomach, upper GI. Mm. And these liposomes are these little cells, like, you know, they're made out of phosphatidylcholine. Same thing your cells are made out of, but we make them super, super small. Mm. And you got your peptide in there, and it'll sail right across the barriers and in. Because normally the peptides go to the GI and they get broken down to the GI. Sure, sure. BPC-157 can go to the GI, but it's mostly to heal the GI uh, less systemically. So the liposomes enable you to get something systemic that you normally would break down in your GI. Like that's how we get glutathione into the body. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to do, you know... Epitalin and thymolin and uh, you know BPC one fifty seven, uh, all yeah. these things that are regenerative peptides and more in what are called the bioregulatory peptides, the ones that were figured out in Russia that that really have shown to be able to extend life really nicely. Love that, bro. Sounds like a good plan. Sounds like good stuff coming up. <laughs> um, it's awesome, man. Um, and lending lending help to the psychedelics industry, you know, trying to get them using some of these delivery platforms so that mm. they can have a, a faster onset and uh, a more stable onset. These uh, particle technologies, they tend to get everybody's blood level pretty similar. 
Mm. I mean, you know, when you're taking mushrooms or something, sure, it's just right. like all over the place. Like, <laughs> I only took one cap, I'm tripping balls. Or, you know, I took five, I don't feel anything. You know, it's that GI variability. Can you speak to that? So that that has to do with GI variability? Like yeah. why a small woman could take a large amount of mushrooms and have X effect and a large man, say me, could take one stem and cap and have perhaps an equally strong effect yeah and well, not really having to do much with like body composition or anything like that seemingly yeah so there's two things there's one is how does it get in that's the bioavailability uh -huh. that's the gi effect is uh -huh. how much you're absorbing it there's also some enzymes there that break psilocybin down to psilocin, which mm. is the active one. Right. So there could be a GI difference, and maybe this, you know, the small little woman's barely absorbing any, and most of it she's just shitting out later. Uh huh. Then there's the whole neurological differences in how much we need to trigger these big responses. Uh. And that is a mixture of your neurochemistry and your, your spiritual uh. life. A lot of mm. us, we just need the mem just need a reminder. Right. Just you like know? a little tap, a little tap. Remember that? <laughs> You're like, Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I, I remember God. I uh -huh. remember my unity with him. I remember <laughs> these fields flowing through me. I remember the synchronicity. Uh huh. Yeah. And some people need, you know, more of a mallet. The kick the door down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting, man. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Is there any, do you see any future where Quicksilver is developing, um, you know, psychedelic yeah. substances, products? You know, I, I tried to get into the cannabis world and we made these great deliveries for cannabis, these sublinguals. Uh -huh. We made, uh, I, you know, designed the beverage systems for Molson Coors' cannabis beverage in, oh, wow, dude. Uh, in Canada. Yeah, uh -huh. it was Trust Beverage. It was a combination of Hexo cannabis and and Molson Coors, and uh, they came to me to design the emulsion system mm. for that. The most beautiful cannabis drinks up there. But fact of the matter was, people just, you know, it's so early on in legalization, they just want a big fucking bag of weed, and they right. want to smoke it. <laughs> you know, and if they get to an edible, they want a gummy. They don't totally. want this high-end stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so it didn't really go all that far. Uh-huh. And But I spent a lot of time on it. And then the psychedelics are coming, and I'm like, oh, man, I... I can make a little nanoparticle MDMA, <laughs> liposomal acid, you know, I can work with the, the mushrooms and, you know, we can get uh, DMT in. We do all these different things, mm. but, you know, are they ready for it? Right, right. How's the regulatory going? Yeah. Right now, you know, it's enough for them to just grind shit up into capsules and yeah. give it to people. And yeah. so, uh, you know, the work I did ends up being, you know, more of the party favor at the psychedelic uh -huh. conferences and uh, less of down, down, down the mainstream. So I see, you know, once there's some interest in it, I'd love to help them with these things, but I don't want to, you know, use up too much time yeah, you're knocking not on like, the door over there. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I love that, dude. Um, Noah, how are we on time there? Oh, perfect, man. Well, Wrap it up with anything you want to, you know, anything you feel compelled to share with these listeners. I know a lot of people are, would love to, they're big fans of Quicksilver. I know that because of me, I'm always talking about it and sharing about it. So anything that, you know, you want them to know or yeah, I mean, you got coming you know, up. If we just. You know, summarize, you know, what, what we've been talking about, you know, we're talking about our essential nature that we have to get to as mm. an open one. Mm -hmm. mm. And when that openness is there, the growth just starts happening. Everything becomes meditation. When we stop this game in our mind that we're doing and we're doing and we're doing that, we're doing that, we're doing that. But on the other hand, these Toxins that are in us are moving us farther away from our openness. Mm. They're reinforcing our closeness. Mm. And so we need to get the toxins out. 
We need to open ourselves up. I mean, I'll never forget when I got my amalgams out and I started taking this stuff that clears all the mercury out of the GI, I realized that I was like, I was contracted around my GI. And all of a sudden, I'm just like hanging out, you know, uh-huh. man spreading, as they say, uh-huh. you know, and I'm like, and my heart on my GI is like open up and I'm like, oh, oh I feel the world through that. Uh, that great. Mm. You know, and that we need to cultivate that emptiness and we need to do the chemistry work for detoxification in us. Mm. But first and foremost is, is the mind and pulling the toxins out of the mind stream, poison, the poisonous Mm. patterns, the poisonous self doubt, the locking ourselves away from the people around us and locking ourselves away from the nurturing. We Mm. have to nurture ourselves Mm. and that nurturing is a big open loving world one of the things that we do is a mistake in biohacking especially early biohackers they were like sympathetic about everything Mm. you know i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna do that and then i'm gonna (laughs) do the cold plunge and then Uh i'm gonna do this thing and then i'm gonna put this machine on my head (laughs) and you know and it's this freaking job that you gotta do and they're all sympathetic about it you know i had a, a dear friend of mine I was getting working on her mercury. She's a big CEO and stuff. And and I said, well, we got to get you into parasympathetic. And she goes, mm. I rep- upregulate parasympathetic several times a day. <laughs> and I was like, that was the best fucking quote ever. <laughs> there is everything wrong with what you just said. Totally. That's the problem. And so back to our paradox and allowing yes, paradox allow that we have to do and we have to allow we have to do and we have to be mm. do mm-hmm. be do be do that was this great <laughs> this great indian metaphysics of you know he's a quantum physicist i'm trying to got swami something got swami uh-huh. and he was in what the bleep then he had his own movie which mm. was so beautiful and he talks about you know his experience of enlightenment and then you know he talks about Times to do and times to be. Mm. Times to do and times to be. Do be, do be, do. Mm. And it's profound. And those are the signs that we have to hold up mm. and allow them to be coming naturally. It's time to do, it's time to be. That is naturally going to let you open up. Ugh. And then whatever path that you want to, whatever meditation path is going to bear fruit for you Mm. once you allow that space. Mm. Love that, dude. Doobie. Doobie, 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 doobie. Amit Goswami, and then one of the great moments, you know, out of the blue for me, I was in the lounge, the United Lounge at DIA. I was about to do an international flight. And, you know, I just watched this movie of his a couple of times, and I hear over the loudspeaker, Mr. Amit Goswami... Mr. Amit Goswami, your wheelchair is ready. And I'm like, no fucking way. What? There he is. Oh, my God. He's sitting there right next to me, and he doesn't hear any of this. And I'm like, Dr. Goswami. And hi. And the beautiful, sweet energy just reeking off of him. And he was pretty old at that point. And, you know, I went and got his wheelchair for him, took a picture, got to talk to him for a little bit. Dude, I love that. Yeah. What an awesome moment. Yeah, it was beautiful. I love that. You know, and he had one other. He has this great, see, it's like emotional. He has this great line that he opens up his movie with. And he said, the world is not a world of things. It's a world of possibilities. Hmm. He says, possibilities for what? Possibilities for consciousness to choose from. Mm. and consciousness is choosing these things for us Mm. more than we're choosing them and so it's part of us allowing the space Mm -hmm. for consciousness to unfold and show us naturally those prioritizations when to do when to be how to be with each other consciousness shows you Mm. and tells you and if you're open and aware to it, 
all this stuff's going to work for you. All those toxins are going to move out. You're going to find your peace. You're going to find your spiritual development. Mm. Boom. Love that, bro. Appreciate you, brother. Love you. I love you, man. So appreciate it. Same. You're the best, bro. Thanks for coming. Really Absolutely. grateful to have spent this time with you. So am I. I know people are going to love this, and uh, that's it, folks. Lots of love to you guys. Thank you to Dr. Shade, the wizard. Love y'all. Peace.